Welcome to the AI Paper Podcast. We're here to cut through the noise and get right into the latest ML research. That's right. And today we're looking at a paper that honestly feels overdue. It's called Rag Anything, All-in-One Rag Framework. Rag Anything. Okay, so this is about retrieval augmented generation, but clearly aiming broader. What's the, uh, the core problem they're tackling? It's fundamental. Standard RAG, as you know, it's great, but it's almost entirely text-based. Right. And that's just not how complex information works in the real world. Think about the documents you probably work with, scientific papers, financial reports, medical charts. Full of visuals, tables, equations. Yeah, exactly. Stuff that text-only RAG is basically blind to. It misses critical information. So the big idea, the key insight in RAG anything is what? How do they fix that blindness? They propose a shift in thinking. Stop seeing documents as just linear text. Instead, see them as these interconnected sets of knowledge entities. Okay, interconnected entities. And they operationalize this with what they call a dual graph construction strategy. It's pretty neat, actually. Dual graph? Yep. So two graph. Yep. They build a cross-modal knowledge graph focusing on the non-text stuff images, tables, and a separate text-based knowledge graph. Then, crucially, they fuse these together. Fusing them. Okay. And how do they use this fused graph for retrieval. That's the cross-modal hybrid retrieval. It's smart. It combines navigating the actual graph structure, like following connections, with standard semantic similarity search using vectors. Best of both worlds. And this actually works. The results look really strong. They show major improvements on tough multimodal benchmarks like DocBench and MM Longbench. And here's the kicker for engineers. The longer and more complex the document, the bigger the performance gap gets. It really seems to validate needing this structure-aware, multimodal approach. Okay, that's the hook. Let's dive deeper. Let's really unpack that core problem first, this critical misalignment, as they call it. Yeah, let's do that. So our rag was and is a brilliant idea, right? Letting LLMs pull in external knowledge dynamically, getting past static training data. Absolutely, game changer. <laughs> but the assumption was always that this external knowledge could be neatly chopped into text chunks. That works for say, Wikipedia articles. Right. Not for a complex schematic in an engineering paper or a multi-axis plot in a research study. Exactly. If you just flatten a complex figure showing, I don't know, experimental results into a simple text caption for AREG, you're losing so much. Sometimes the entire point is in the visual structure, the relationships. And this isn't just academic nitpicking. This hits practitioners directly. If you're querying scientific literature, the core findings might only be clear from the plots or diagrams. Text only RA is just going to miss them. Or financial analysis. Good luck understanding market trends or correlations just from text descriptions. Yeah. You need the charts, the matrices. Right. And think about medicine. Critical information in radiology images, complex clinical data tables, standard ARG pipelines often just can't see or interpret that structured visual data properly, it's a systemic blind spot. So Arig Anything is trying to address, what, three main technical hurdles here? Yeah, they frame it around three challenges. First, unified multimodal representation. How do you bring text, tables, images, equations, all these different types of information into one system without losing their specific meaning or context? That sounds hard enough on its own. It is. Then second, structure-aware decomposition. When you get a complex PDF, maybe with figures spanning pages or weird layouts, how do you parse it intelligently? You can't just read top to bottom. You need to preserve the layout, the hierarchy. Like understanding which caption belongs to which subfigure, or that these cells are part of this specific table. Precisely. And the third challenge naturally follows, cross-modal retrieval. Once you've somehow captured all this rich, structured, multimodal information, how do you actually search it effectively? How do you query in text but get back the relevant part of an image or navigate from a paragraph to the specific table cell it references? Okay, so representation, decomposition, and retrieval across modalities. <laughs> Let's tackle representation and decomposition first. How does RA anything ingest this messy multimodal input? They call the first step multimodal knowledge unification, basically indexing. They use specialized parsers designed for different content types, text chunks, figures and their captions, tables and their cells, equations. So specific tools for each type, not trying to force everything through one text processor. Exactly. The goal is to break the input down into meaningful atomic units. But crucially, while doing that, they maintain the connections. A figure stays linked to its caption and equation to its definition in the text. 
a table cell to its row and column headers. They abstract away the file format PDF, DOC, JPG, whatever, into these content units, these like little bundles of data and metadata. And preserving those connections must be vital for the next step, right? The dual graph construction, you mentioned this is the core innovation. It really is because they recognize you can't just jam, say, a detailed diagram and a paragraph of analysis into the same simplistic structure without losing something important. So they build two graphs. <laughs> Why two? Why not try to make one super graph? Well, it seems they felt forcing everything into one graph structure might compromise how well you represent each modality. So they create two complementary graphs, optimized for different things. Think of it like having, I don't know, a detailed street map and also a separate directory of landmarks. Okay, interesting analogy. Let's start with the first one. The cross-modal knowledge graph. What goes in there? Is that where the visuals and tables live? Pretty much, yeah. This graph uses the non-textual units, images, tables, equations as anchor points. And here's a clever bit. They use multimodal LLMs, MLLMs, to generate rich textual representations for these non-text chunks. More than just a simple caption, though. Oh, yeah. They generate two things per chunk. First, a detailed description, which is great for a semantic search later. And second, an entity summary, basically. Key concepts or items mentioned or shown, which is perfect for building the graph connections. So the image or table itself becomes a node explicitly linked via belongsto edges to related entities identified in the text or by the MLLM. Okay, so that graph really centers the non-text stuff and links it intelligently. What about the second graph, the text-based knowledge graph? But that one is more like what you might see in other graph rag approaches, like light rag or graph rag that they mention. It focuses on extracting entities and relationships purely from the textual content, building a knowledge graph based on traditional NLP and graph construction methods. So you have these two specialized graphs. How do they become one unified system? Through graph fusion and entity alignment. This is where they bring the two maps together. They use matching keys like entity names, maybe dates, key concepts that appear in both text and associated non-text elements to intelligently merge the cross-modal graph and the text-based graph. Oh, finding the common landmarks to overlay the maps. Exactly. This results in one comprehensive graph, let's call it G, that captures both the fine-grained relationships within the text and the crucial cross-modal links between text and visuals or tables. And that's the structural index, just the graph. Almost. That structural graph G is then paired with a comprehensive embedding table, let's call it T. This table stores dense vector representations for everything, all the entities, all the relationships defined in the graph, and all the original atomic content chunks, text and non-text alike. Wow. So the final index, I, is actually this pair. Mm -hmm. The unified structural graph G and the big embedding table T that gives you both structure for reasoning and vectors for similarity search. Precisely. It's a unified structural and vector index. That sounds computational intensive to build. Yeah. Generating multiple representations, building two graphs, aligning them. Is the payoff and retrieval really worth that upfront engineering cost? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? And I think the retrieval architecture they designed really aims to justify that complexity. This brings us to the cross-modal hybrid retrieval part. Okay, how does it work? It starts smart with modality-aware query encoding. Meaning? It actually looks at your query. If you use words like figure, show me the chart, what is the equation for, it picks up on those lexical cues. Ah, so it tries to guess if you're asking for text or an image or something else. Kind of, yeah. It infers a modality preference. This helps ensure that your maybe purely textual query can still effectively tap into the non-textual information via those shared embeddings and graph links they build. It respects the user's likely intent. Okay, that makes sense. Then what? Does it search the graph or the vectors? Both. That's the hybrid part. It fires off two search strategies at the same time. First, structural knowledge navigation. This uses the unified graph G. The map search. Exactly. It's looking for explicit connections, pathways, relationships defined in the graph. It might do keyword matching on nodes, but then it strategically expands outwards, exploring the neighborhood around those nodes within a certain number of hops. Why is that so important? Because this is how you find connections that simple vector similarity might miss. Think multi-hop reasoning. Finding information that's linked through a chain of entities or relationships, maybe connecting a concept mentioned on page 5 to a specific diagram on page 50 through shared entities in the graph. Things dense retrieval might struggle with if the wording is different. Okay, so graph traversal for the explicit long-range connections What's the second search mechanism? That's the more familiar semantic similarity matching. 
This is your classic vector search. It takes the query embedding and searches for similarity across everything in that big embedding table, t-text chunks, image descriptions, table representations, entities, the works. Right, so this catches the nuanced semantic links, even if there isn't a direct structural path in the graph. Precisely. It captures semantic relevance when the explicit structure isn't there. Or maybe it's just too complex to find quickly through graph traversal alone. So you get candidates back from the graph search and candidates back from the vector search. How do they combine them to yeah. stick them together? They merge the two sets of candidates, yes. But then comes a crucial ranking step using multi-signal fusion scoring. Multi-signal fusion. Yeah, sounds fancy. It means they don't just rely on one score, they combine multiple signals. How important is a node structurally in the graph? How similar is it semantically based on vectors? And what was the modality preference inferred from the query? They integrate all of that to get the final ranking. Ah, so it's using the graph structure, the vector similarity, and the query intent to decide what's most relevant. That sounds much more robust than just one method. Exactly. That integrated ranking is key to avoiding the problem where the system just defaults to text, even when the answer is clearly sitting in a table or a figure the user implicitly asked for. Okay, the architecture makes sense. It's complex, but you can see the logic. Now, about that cost benefit, did it actually perform better in their experiments? That's where it gets really compelling. They tested Rag Anything on some pretty demanding benchmarks. DocBench, for instance, uses documents up to nearly 200 pages across different domains, and MM LongBench, which specifically focuses on long context, multimodal understanding. Now the results. Pretty decisive, according to the paper. They showed superior overall accuracy compared to some strong baselines, including uh, GPT-4 Mini and even other graph-based methods like MM Graph Rag. Okay, better overall. Yeah. But you mentioned something earlier about long documents. Yes. This is, I think, the most striking finding and the real justification for the dual graph complexity. The performance advantage of RAG Anything became dramatically larger as the document length increased. Much larger. On DocBench, for documents over 100 pages, the gap grew significantly. And for those over 200 pages, the paper reports Eben Anything achieved around 68.8% accuracy compared to the best baselines, 55.0%. That's nearly a 14-point difference. Wow, 14 points. That's that's huge. That's not just noise. That's a fundamentally better capability for complex, lengthy material. Absolutely. It strongly suggests that capturing and leveraging that explicit structure is not just helpful, but maybe essential when dealing with information scattered across long, multimodal documents. The ablation studies they ran seem to back this up too. What do the ablations show? They tested a chunk-only version, basically anything without the dual graph construction, just decomposing the content and using vector search. Its accuracy plummeted to around 60.0% overall on DocBench. So just breaking things down isn't enough. You need the graph structure. That seems to be the clear message. They also found that adding sophisticated re-ranking on top of the chunk-only approach gave only marginal gains. The structural graph itself was the main driver of the performance leap. Let's make this concrete. The paper included case studies, right? Can we walk through one? Yeah, they had a couple of good ones. Case study one looked at interpreting a multi-panel figure in a research paper. The query was about distinguishing which model, DAE or VAE, showed clear separation in its style space based on adjacent TSNE plots in the figure. Okay, a visual reasoning task requiring understanding figure layout. Right. And traditional methods, even strong ones, apparently got confused. Yeah. They struggled to differentiate the style space panel from the adjacent content space panel because they lacked that spatial structural understanding of the figure layout. They might pull text mentioning both or describe the wrong panel. And argue anything. Because it built that visual layout graph where the different panels, axes, legends, or actual nodes with relationships, mm. it could use the query terms, style space, separation, to navigate the graph specifically to the relevant panel for the DAE model. So it didn't just see pixels or a caption, it saw distinct related components within the figure. Exactly. It navigated the structure to pinpoint the right visual evidence leading to the correct answer. The DAE model showed clearer separation in its style space. The structure was the key differentiator. Okay, that clearly shows the value for visual data. What about structured data, like tables? Case study two tackled that. It involved a financial report table. The query was specific. Find Novo Nordisk's wages and salaries for the year 2020. Sounds simple, but financial tables can be dense. Lots of similar terms. Precisely. If you just treat the table as linear text, it's easy to grab the wrong number, maybe from the wrong year or the wrong company, or confuse wages with some other financial term. 
baseline struggled with this. How did Artie anything handle it? It transformed the table into a structured graph. Think nose for row headers, Novo Nordisk, wages and salaries, column headers, 2020, 2019, and the actual data cells with edges connecting them logically. For example, this cell is at the intersection of this row and this column. So it could literally trace the path, find Novo Nordisk row, find wages and salaries sub row, follow it across to the 2020 column node and retrieve the value from the connected data cell node. That's the idea. And it allowed it to precisely retrieve the correct value, 26,778 million DKK. Again, navigating the explicit structure was crucial for accuracy in a way that flat text or simple vector search couldn't replicate reliably. These examples really drive home the point. It seems the main impact of art anything is this unified approach. I think so. The paper argues it eliminates the kind of architectural fragmentation we see where text is handled one way, images another, if at all, tables yet another. By imposing this consistent structured modeling using the dual graph approach across all modalities, it establishes a more robust foundation. A new baseline for truly multimodal RJ systems, perhaps. That seems to be the aspiration. But to their credit, they also highlighted where even this advanced system shows cracks pointing towards future work. Oh, what are the remaining challenges or failure cases? They found a couple of critical ones in their analysis. First, a lingering text-centric retrieval bias. Meaning it still prefers text, even when it shouldn't. Yeah. Even with the cross-modal graph and MLLM descriptions, the systems sometimes preferentially retrieve purely textual sources, even when the query implicitly or explicitly asks for visual information, especially if the visual content doesn't have perfect keyword overlap. That cross-modal attention mechanism, the link between the modalities, still needs strengthening. Okay, so the text bias is hard to shake completely. What else? Second, rigid spatial processing patterns. This came up particularly with complex layouts or tables that didn't follow simple top to bottom, left to right reading order. Ah, like unusual table structures or documents where information flows unexpectedly. Exactly. Current models, including our go eat anything to some extent, still seem to default to these sequential scanning assumptions. They lack truly adaptive spatial reasoning to handle layouts that break the standard mold. They can get lost if the structure is too unconventional. That rigidity, it really highlights that we're still mostly dealing with static documents, doesn't it? It does, and that leads directly to the provocative thought for you, our listeners, especially the engineers out there thinking about building these systems. Go on. Well, if this dual graph construction, this explicit structure-aware approach, is proving so essential just for navigating fixed multimodal documents like complex PDFs, detailed reports, what does that imply for the next generation of knowledge sources? You mean things that aren't static documents? Exactly. Think about dynamic, continuously evolving multimodal knowledge bases, live financial dashboards with updating charts and tables, real-time video streams with overlays and spoken commentary, interactive simulations generating data on the fly. Where the content and the structure are fluid. Right. If structure is key, how will future REG systems need to adapt their retrieval mechanisms, their graph representations maybe, to handle knowledge where the structure itself is constantly shifting and evolving in real time? That's, yeah, that's a fascinating challenge. Building structure-aware REG for static docs is hard enough. Doing it for dynamic, live data streams, that really is the next frontier. Definitely something to think about. A great place to leave it for today. Thanks for breaking down REG anything. My pleasure. It's important work. And thank you for tuning into the AI Paper Podcast. We'll catch you next time.